Yes, so last time we uh, said that to compute the entanglement entropy, first one needs to compute the partition function on a replicated space, so an n fold cover, and then we need to take some analytic continuation. And we saw the difficulties in the closed string. So to compute z on n fold cover, that we take coordinates r tau and some x1 to x d minus 2. And then what this n fold cover means is that tau is identified after tau plus 2 pi. Okay. So the space has a conical deficit and so on and so forth. So it's not a good string background because we don't know what the even the tree level string theory is on these kinds of spaces. But we what we can do is instead of making this identification, we can think of a space with tau identified with tau plus 2 pi divided by n, where n is a natural number. Like, well, 1 is the usual case. But so, so what this looks like is in two of the directions, this, this looks like 2 pi over n. And this is identified with that times, let's say, r8. So this space becomes R2 mod Zn times R8, okay? So we want to consider string theory on this order fold. At least at tree level, it's well defined. And we want to consider the partition functions of, of strings propagating in this family of space times labeled by n. Now before we go to n and so on, let's just focus on n equals 1, just flat space. Okay, so what do we have? We have the sphere diagram. It's just the vacuum amplitude that we're computing. And we said last time that if you don't insert any vertex operators on the sphere, this diagram is naively zero because of the unfixed SL2C invariance. So in the closed string sector, then there's a torus diagram, which can be computed. And at least for flat space, people have computed it. Uh, Polchinski was one of the first people to do this. And But let's talk about the open string sector. So in the open string sector, there's the disk diagram, which is, so this is order 1 over g string squared. This is 1 over g string to the 0. And this is 1 over g string, okay? And the one loop diagram here is the cylinder diagram or the annulus diagram, which is 1 over g string to the 0. So today, I want to spend the first half of the talk talking about the disk diagram and the second half talking about the cylinder diagram. Now, the disk diagram is also naively zero because of the unfixed SL2R um, gate symmetries. Okay, so let's just recall that the disk diagram is naively something, which is some determinants and so on and so forth, divided by the volume of SL2R. And this is infinite, so this, this, is, this is zero, naively. But there's a paper by Liu and Polchinski from 1988, which sort of explains how to deal with this denominator. Okay, so the idea is that SL2R is nothing but the set of two by two real matrices with determinant one. So we can write these two by two matrices as follows, such that A squared minus B squared minus C squared plus D squared equals one. This is just the determinant equals one. And we identify this as also as Lorentzian ADS3 space. Okay, so we can write out a metric on this space. So ds squared is d rho squared minus cosh squared rho d p squared plus cinch squared rho d phi squared. Okay, rho is some radial coordinate and t is kept compact. The t direction is just goes from 0 to 2 pi. We haven't done this un uh, covering space that we usually talk about when we go to ADS because all we want to just compute is volume of SL2R, not of ADS3. Okay. And of course, in row, we are going to put some cutoff. And the metric volume factor here is like this. So this is a completely elementary integral. You can do this, and you get pi squared over 2 times e to the 2 rho c, negative 2 plus e to the negative 2 rho c. 
Okay, so the idea in this paper is to just drop this term. It, it's the term causing the divergence in the volume of SL2R, but the claim is let's just define the volume of SL2R to be this finite piece that's left over. Sorry? We'll explain why. Yes, 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 of course. So this is a prescription and you get some answer for the disk diagram. The question is, can you check this against something? Why is this reasonable? Okay, that's one thing you can ask. So one other diagram that is finite in the string in the disk is this, where you insert a closed string vertex operator in the middle of the disk. So this is just so-called uh, tadpole diagrams. In, in a more space-time picture, it would look like there's an open string that's, that's propagating, and in the middle, it sort of emits a closed string <coughs> like that. So it's just, just an open string going, and it emits a closed string. So this kind of diagrams are called tadpole diagrams. And the point here is that the thing in the denominator here, it, there are some determinants, and it's a one-point function of a vertex operator. But the unfixed gauge group here is just U1. This U1 is just rotating U about this point on the disk. So this diagram is completely finite and had been calculated before by, in papers by Grinstein, Wise, and Douglas. There are two papers, Mike Douglas. Okay, and they found some answer. Now, now, what's the point? Why are we sort of looking at this diagram and then looking at this diagram? The point is there's a theorem that says that these two diagrams have to be equal. This so-called soft dilaton theorem. Okay, and this is essentially the statement that if you look at the space-time effective action, the root G in the open string sector has to come with e to the negative phi. Okay, so when we expand this, this is some ddx of root g times one minus phi. Okay, so this closed string diagram is computing this term, and this thing without any operator is computing this term. So they have a precise relationship. Okay, and when you define the volume of SL2R this way, this identity works out, the soft Dilaton theorem works out. Sorry? So there's a normalization of the dilaton that should be important here. The relative coefficient is fixed by how you normalize e to the minus phi here. Well, that is fixed if you, I mean, this has to be 1 over g string, right? The disk diagram is to be 1 over g string. So once you fix conventions, the relative factor here is unambiguously determined. You could fix it in the closed string sector also. You could yeah. have the canonical kinetic yes. term for it. That you'd have e to the minus 2 phi times yeah. uh, yeah. so but the point is once you fix that convention this coefficient is fixed by that and so the, this procedure of setting the volume of sl2r equals negative phi squared makes the soft dilaton theorem works out actually the story is more interesting so in these papers which predate this liu polchinski paper these people claim that this soft dilaton theorem is just wrong because we compute this diagram we get something some answer, and this one they said is just zero because of this fact. So the claim in these papers is that the soft dilaton theorem is not a theorem. Now it gets more interesting because when Liu and Polzinski <coughs> computed this, <coughs> there is some numerical offset between, so this diagram in these papers was actually incorrect. It had to do with some subtlety of how to define the actual dilaton vertex operator and so on. So this negative pi squared actually helped to fix this calculation in the end. I am just trying to understand why is this, this cutoff in this row C a good cutoff? You know, I could have, uh, what's the physical reason to put a cutoff in that way? Yes. Yeah, okay, so I will now try to motivate this uh, in a couple of more things. I, I mean, there is no concrete, again, the best I'm going to do is, is one more thing, which is SL2R mod U1 is the two-dimensional Euclidean hyperbolic space. And there's a natural way to cut off the volume of hyperbolic space. It's, it's, it's the same like rho C cutoff. Yeah, but minus 2 pi. Yeah, exactly. So that is this minus 2 pi that's feeding in times 2 pi is this 
thing. And that, that is also another independent thing. I mean, if you, if these papers by Klebanov and such, they have complete one loop determinants yeah. of scalar teams and so on on ADS2 cross S1. Uh -huh. and Euclidean ADS2, 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 yes. And they had to use this minus. Yeah. So it's this, this shows up in quite a few places, like even in Ashok's calculations of yeah. partition on ADS2, this fact shows up. But you can say, okay, you are just like waving your hands and this is all, but you can really make it more precise in the superstring case, for example. So let's say we are in some supersymmetric string theory, then this SL2R goes over to, in let's say, <coughs> the type 1 case, uh, OSP1 slash 2. Thus, it becomes a supergroup. Okay, this for, I will just say what this OSP1 slash 2 is. It means this SP goes with the 2, so there's an SP2 part for this group, which is nothing but SL2R. Okay, so it has three bosonic generators, three bosonic, these TAs, and it has two fermionic generators. Okay, so there's basically some general group element looks like exponential of i theta a t a plus i psi b g b. So this is just some supergroup where you have some some of the directions of the group are Grassmann. So now what's the point? The point is again you can compute the volume of try to compute the volume of OSP one slash two divided by u one. And let me just go into a little bit more detail of how this calculation would be done. So first is you use an identity which relates this to another coset, this SU1 comma 1 slash 1 mod U1 slash 1. Okay, so what are all these ones? Again, this SU1 comma 1 is nothing but uh, SL2R that, that we see. And this modding out essentially makes the counting work out right. But this thing has a nice description in terms of a space <coughs> with two bosonic complex coordinates and one complex Grassmann coordinate equals one, okay? And on this space, there is a second, there is a form So this SU1 comma 1 slash 1 group is the form that preserves that. So it's preserved by SU1 comma 1 slash 1. <laughs> and the point, the stabilizer group of let's say the point 1 comma 0 comma 0 is this, this denominator, is U1 slash 1. So basically what we're doing is, is computing the volume of this space by computing the volume of this space. Okay, if you forgot about this part and put a plus sign here, this is just the S3. It's like, okay. So now you can go ahead and construct a metric or, or just directly construct the volume form on this space. And the volume form looks something like dz1, dz1 bar. Let me just call it d, dz, d chi d chi bar, oh, sorry, of course, I should say there's a, there's a phase that is modded out. The overall phase of z1, z2, and psi is not important. Divided by one minus z, z bar plus chi chi bar. Okay, so this is the volume form on this space. Chi is the same as psi. Sorry? Chi is the same as psi. Yeah, chi is the same as psi after taking out an overall factor. So it's just, you have to define some homogeneous coordinate, so, so z1 if you set to 1, then z2 is z and psi is chi. Okay. So this is the volume form. Now, naively, uh, you have to integrate this, you know, over these Grassmann coordinates, chi and chi bar, so you can expand out this denominator. But you still have to put a cutoff. The cutoff variable again now here is, is, has to be this denominator variable, because that's the thing that's nicely invariant under this space. So once you put in a supersymmetric cutoff, which means putting in a theta function of one minus z z bar plus chi chi bar minus epsilon, okay, and then integrating, you get a finite result.
essentially you should think of it as the integral over the Grassmann directions ends up canceling this infinity by itself. And you're left with this finite, this finite, the same finite number that you would have gotten. Okay, so you can do this. This this procedure can be implemented. And this gives basically a finite. Rate. Okay, this is this stuff is not published anywhere, and this was with conversations. Okay, so here there is some, you know, I don't know, maybe this makes you happier that <coughs> this procedure is justified, but, but whatever. I just wanted to lay out this set of, set of calculations. Okay, you might say, now you've told me how to fix SL2R, why can't we fix SL2C in the same way? No, I would yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in principle it has nothing to do with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just throwing out at you all these sort of things that seem to be connected, but nobody has quite managed to put everything together in a nice coherent story. Aren't you saying that the volume of SL2R divided by this exponential of, if I, if I pull out this exponential, that object is your minus pi square. I am just left with the cutoff space. Yes. Am I right? Yeah, so it's a cutoff space, it's a big space, and you have thrown out a big piece of the volume. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. You have thrown out this, this, this piece. Yeah, that's like when we try to define things that are infinite and make them finite, we can get negative. <laughs> one plus two plus three is negative one. Plus three. So that's why I was wondering whether there is some sort of a natural regularization of this. I mean, so what you're essentially in all this is talking of different ways of regularizing it and uh, defining some kind of an analytic continuation of the volume. Uh, whether, uh, whether there's some natural way to do it in terms of the Laplacian, I mean the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on SL2, I mean the, uh, uh, which uh, again it would be like a zeta function like regularization, uh, uh, which uh, in which you throw out sort of a zero mode factor and then probably are left with this thing. Is there, a is there some natural way to view it that way? Uh, as a, because it's like throwing out some zero, I mean some, uh, the divergent piece, which is uh, you, you, you're you keeping all the eigenvalues except maybe. Anyway, we can talk about it later. I was yeah. just wondering if that was a threat. I mean, I want to sort of, sort of point out that if you were doing, let's say, DSCFP, right, you were looking at boundary of H2, like a theory that lives on the boundary of H2, this would be nothing but the partition function of, of that theory. Right, so there we, exp from ADS-CFT, we know that the partition functions contain these divergent terms and we, as we go to larger and larger radius, and they're just sort of pretty normal. It's, we, it's the, that's the kind of the, the spirit. Yeah, so there also you do this regularization, the holographic yes. uh, renormalization. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, so it is in that spirit, but I, I agree. But uh, what I was asking was whether th there's some uh, intrinsic way. I, I, I think it's what uh, was earlier asked. I mean, does the row cutoff seems li a little uh, arbitrary, uh, but uh, and you're picking out a finite piece you're throwing out a particular divergent piece and picking out a finite piece. Picking out finite piece is always a little arbitrary, but there is, uh, <coughs> if there's some natural way uh, uh, for us, like a, you know, Yeah, I guess what you're asking is, if I made this boundary of H2 a little bit wiggly instead of a perfect circle, would you get the same finite piece? Uh, it would be up to you, right? But depending on how you define it, I could, I could always make uh, yeah. some coordinate in which uh, the leading piece is not e to the two row. I mean, I, it would be e to the two row minus uh, five or something like that. I mean, I could always. 
uh, in yeah, another I, coordinate it would look different, right? You're just picking out a particular divergent piece. The, it's always ambiguous, the finite piece in a particular scheme. But, uh, I don't know, like finite pieces can be universal. For example, the one example that comes to mind is entanglement entropy in two dimensions. Two space dimensions. Yeah. 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 So, so here I'm not. Really so what you're asking is a is a question whether you know if I take this space H two hyperbolic space, and I make a cut which is sort of a wiggly cut, not sort of a circle. Yeah, that's right. What what is this procedure as you take? Just, just use different coordinates. Yeah, just use yeah. different coordinates. Hyperbolic set of coordinates. But what do you cut off? But Are you, you can. Sure you get this answer? No, but it could be, right, as you take this bigger and bigger. The point is... Uh, uh, supposing I use the usual coordinates on ADS, which was like... The you will get the same answer. If you use sort of a coordinate, which is becoming U1 symmetric near infinity, you will get the same answer. So, I don't know. The only thing I that... Mean, my U1, it's, a, it's a matter of what you choose to drop, right? Uh, uh, well, may, maybe not, right? Because you're going very far away into hyperbolic space and this, there's a structure there. So what I have checked, if you go to from rho to some r or something, this is not, that is not going to change this result. I mean, we can do this calculation, convert from, make like cosh rho equals, cinch rho equals r and so on and so forth. That is not going to change the result. Sure, if you make a transformation just of rho to some other variable, then clearly not, right? It yeah, exactly. From, from, from just from the, the, the yeah, exactly. So all that thing will be sort of here. That's right. So, you but if you make this sort of more wiggly, that is the calculation that I haven't done. That's right. That I don't know. That would be the thing which. which yeah. Would be yeah. So yeah. this 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 I don't know. Uh, yeah, you want symmetric, of course, puts a big uh, restriction because uh, yeah, I, I was thinking of some other arbitrary change which would probably be equivalent to what you say, um, making it somehow. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so these ones I haven't checked, but th these can be checked. Uh, it's not. Anyhow, this this is all in the literature and it's very confusing. Uh, I, I don't really know what to make of it, to be honest. And you're right, I, we have no reason to trust this as a as a principle of string theory or something. It's interesting that one, once you do this, it works, the soft Dilaton theorem works out correctly and they were actually able to correct this calculation. That's all I'm sort of saying. Right, but sometimes there are natural ways, like you said, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is minus uh, 1 by 12 or whatever. Yeah, so uh, if I can sort of convince you that if, if I can do the calculation for this sort of arbitrary wiggly cut and get the same answer, that would be a proof. Right? That no matter what you do near infinity in ADS2 is going to give you the same. But I don't believe that will be true. Because okay, that's the calculation that can be done. But I, it cannot, I mean, I don't see any reason why it should be true. I mean, the point is, so if you think of the boundary CFT, right, there is no, for what this making this wiggly cut corresponds to is putting the boundary theory on a different metric, right? And we know that in a 1D theory, there is no conformal anomaly. So that's the kind of thing that will come in, that the finite piece of the partition function of a 1D theory, there's no conformal anomaly. So if I change the metric on the, where the theory is living, it's not going to affect the finite piece of the partition function. And in, in H3, what was I going to say next, that's not going to be true, right? Because we know that that changes. So I think, yeah, okay, I, that's a proof in H2 that no matter what wiggly cut you make, the finite piece is going to be the same. Maybe yes. for the one dimensional case. Oh, in, in every even dimensional hyperbolic space, that will be true. H4 and H6 and H8 and so on. But that's only the wild factor. In higher dimensions, that can be other different models. Sure, yeah. yeah. So I see that uh, newer equations have some other arguments. So they say uh, take three points in a circle and then uh, put a cutoff that says that the points can't come closer than some. Uh, and, yeah. uh, so then, and then do the integral and then so they, they have this cutoff and then they say that's a more coordinated way of doing it. So you think of three points in a circle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, the cutoff is if points can't get close to close. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, that's then, um, and then they get the same uh, the same minus five. Okay. Yeah. So but yeah, I think this 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 is that okay for at least for That might be a yeah, it, that, that might be a yeah. Okay, 
So now you might say, okay, we have done something with SL2R, why can't we do play the same game with SL2C, right? Now these issues that you're raising actually come in, like because as we were just discussing, the volume of SL2C in this row type coordinates will have a term that's like e to the something plus rho c plus, but it will have a term that's proportional to rho c and plus like blah, blah, blah. So now you can say if I make rho c to rho c plus one, then the finite piece changes, right? And yeah, that's right. So that's why the closed string case has not been able to be dealt with this way. But there again, taking an analogy from the fact that H3 would be dual to a CFT2 and there would be a logarithmic conformal anomaly, the coefficient of this rho c is actually universal. So that will not change under any kind of coordinate change. So actually there are papers by Zeitlin um, that claim that this volume of SL2C should be replaced by the, this coefficient alpha. But so again, this is like a big question mark. Can you do this? Now the point is, there is no cross check like this for the closed string case. There is no sort of other thing that you can relate this proposal to. In the open string case, we were lucky, and and you know there was this other thing that we could check the proposal and made made sense. But here, I don't know of a calculation, a, 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 a completely independent calculation that can be related to this. A vacuum sphere diagram, and therefore you can confirm this this claim of like that. Is there a way to make sense of this in string field theory? Can actually yeah, unfortunately, I don't know any string field theory, so I can't really give a useful comment. Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody has a useful, something useful to say. It would be nice if there's some <coughs> well defined formalism with this was there. I, I, I see that the person's theory of some comments, which has been labeled, this is an IR effect, and there should be uh, some aspect. Yeah, that is related to this fact that what you were saying that you put a UV cutoff on the points coming close on the string world sheet. But we know that UV cutoffs on the world sheet corresponds to infrared cutoffs in the space time. So that's that's the spirit of that comment. Yeah, um, okay, anyway, this is sort of, you know, the spirit of these talks is just to sort of give you a flavor of the things I'm like thinking about and I'm confused about and there's, I'm not claiming that there is any sort of, you know, big uh, result here or anything, but these are sort of interesting <coughs> papers to know about. This is an interesting paper. I don't know, cycling papers I find unreadable, so I can't really, Say much, but these papers are nice and they compute these uh, tadpoles and so on. If you view SL2C as some uh, <coughs> sphere fibered over S uh, yeah. over SL2R and then use the SL2R result, I mean, can you can kind of uh, do that? I mean, probably it, sh the cosine, it should exist. The cosine, the non trivial vibration. The cosine that I know is this. Right. So there the H3 has this problem that it has the 2D CFT has a conformal anomaly and the coefficient of that. Again, like by, by doing this cosine, so SU2 is compact, so that, that, that's fine. So we have to compute the volume of H3. The volume of H3, when we compute, we run into this problem of, of, of per precisely this kind of a term. And I don't know of a different quotient, like where you can mod SL2C by SL2R. I don't give you SL. Yeah, I, I meant SL2R as a base, so that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Know. I don't know if that that that. Maybe if it exists, that would be nice. Can yes. No, this is just at zero loops. Zero, zero just zero loops. Because of this problem that, uh, <coughs> yes, yes. And in the disk, you would have also thought that you cannot compute. This is this is this is zero loops, right? This is one loops. Yeah. So this we have this problem with SL2C. 
Here, this, there was the SL2R, but we saw that this SL2R got resolved in these ways. Or not resolved, but there are some hints that this should really be the correct definition. OK, so now let's move on to one loop diagrams. And uh, so, so we, yes, yes, yes. Thought, maybe. Uh, I mean, I was thinking maybe roughly like how you wrote it there. You have a square minus b square minus c square plus b square to the one. Yes. Uh, a, b, c, d are all real. Yes. But now you let a, b, c, d be all complex. complex. Yeah. So that uh, is, is essentially you're putting phase factors over uh, over each of the a, b, c, d's. You can think mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. So those, it's like some toric. Yeah, but you have circle, to. There, there might be, there might, would be some singular obstructions, but. Uh, so you have to make sure that the action is homogeneous, right? And it covers. Uh, the action is homogeneous. No, yeah, I just promote ABCD to complex. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So that's a complete description of this. But yeah. starting with ABCD real and adding phases. So you get a mod by A times E to the I theta A. And yeah. so you get above each real this thing, there's a theta a, theta b, theta c, theta hmm. b with some yeah uh, identification. So it's like some p3 or something. Uh, I mean, locally, it seems like some u1. Anyway, uh, okay, uh, uh, can be maybe some yeah, yeah. Uh, some picture like that, and then you combine it with this minus y squared. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Okay, by the way, one comment I should say is like, we did this OSP one slash two. There are analogous supergroups for the closed string case. So the type two and the heterotic strings have analogous supergroups. But it is believed that even after you do the computation of the volume of the supergroup, you might cancel out this guy, but this conformal anomaly will remain. But I haven't done that calculation. I mean, there are some subtleties in the supergroups involved in the closed string case. Okay, so summarize, we, we wanted to compute the, yeah, we wanted to compute uh, the entanglement entropy in string theory. We had to compute the partition function on these n-fold covers. We said, forget about the n-fold cover, let's just first talk about the partition function on just empty flat space. We discussed so far the sphere diagram and the disk diagram, and we found a way in these papers to make sense of the disk diagram. That means getting rid of this infinity, getting rid of this problem that there's a non-compact, unfixed. You had some intuition why you wanted a finite answer. Yeah, the finite, the intuition comes indirectly because there is this other diagram that you can consider. That's this one point function. That is perfectly finite because the group is just U1. And there's a theorem that relates these two diagrams. Well, the theorem is independent of this. The theorem is independent of, so this actually shows how the theorem is true. But why the theorem is there in the first place, it has to do with just how the dilaton couples to the metric, like what we know from space-time physics of the dilaton. So that's why in these papers there was this confusion whether this theorem we should really be true or not. But it is true, and this way, this thing provides a way for this theorem to be true. The sphere, we still haven't made sense of. So this is question mark, and this is maybe. <coughs> in just flat space. In the covering spaces or these orbifolds, I still, there are, nobody has computed this disk diagram yet, because the maps are different now, and they're into some orbifold. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the. Sorry, why is there analog here using the normalization of the space time action for a closed string? So, what's the obvious reason? It's, I, I might have what, what? a similar trick uh, now in the closed string case, right? As this something like this theorem? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, space time action, and you know, I. I yeah. Uh, <laughs> and some, some emission of some uh, dilaton, and then. Yeah, but we see again from a closed string. 
Yeah, there is no there is this emission of a dilaton from a closed string is not a. Yeah. It's, it's again a background. Good, but I mean, I can and this I can expand to. No, I mean, I can look at. Uh, let's see. Um, it's like a cosmological constant term or something like that, yes. which is kind of the. Mm. Uh, uh, Yeah, the three uh, dilaton scattering. You're saying there's no way to fix the. Yeah, because you need to, yeah, zero point function without any closed strings. Yeah, yeah. this is zero point function, but I'm just saying here, in this case, we took the zero point function by saying we have a space time action. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. there was a, but there was a one there. You could compare meaningfully to that with the x root g. Can't we have, but we have a one, I mean, we have one also in the closed string. That's the cosmological. That's the cosmological constant. So then, uh... yeah, I mean, w w maybe one thing that I said last time is again helpful. Like, if you do have a parameter in in the family, if you have a family of nonlinear sigma models, and you can take three derivatives with respect to that parameter. That object is perfectly well defined now because it's a three point function on a sphere. So, the most concrete way to check any of these proposals for the closed string case would be to do a three point function computation and then integrate back three times. Like, like in the Louisville case. Okay, I, I want to get to Witten's paper, so let's uh, defer this. Okay, so about these torus and cylinders. So these diagrams are conceptually easier because this uh, this unfixed group is just compact or not there. The, so yeah, the torus diagram, as I said, on flat space was computed long ago by Polchinski. What we want to do now is compute this on on this space, right? R two mod Z n times R eight. So. <coughs> First, you have to project onto the singlet states of Zn as usual in orbifolds, and then introduce twisted sector states. So, there are some technical complications because of which this computation has not been done yet. And uh, yeah, okay. This calculation was done in this paper by. What are the technical complications in the torus? It's just that. You have to analytically continue in n, and as we'll see, the analytic continuation yeah, is. For a fixed n, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have some twisted sector states, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's only if you want to come analytically continue yes. to that two pi, yes. n, two pi n thing. Yes, so yes, yes. Once yes. we have an answer for all n, there's no natural analytic As we'll see, there are subtleties. Like, uh, yeah, for. Because there is this theorem, this Carlson's theorem, and you have to satisfy the conditions of the theorem before you analytically continue. So that's sort of a, of a hurdle. So this is this subject of this paper. Okay, so let's just get a perspective straight. So. Do we have open string fluctuations around the vacuum, right? That depends on which string theory you're considering. So in the type one case, we have a D9 brain in the vacuum and therefore there are open string excitations. But that theory is unoriented. And again, so you will have more diagrams. There is not just the cylinder diagram, but there's the Mobius strip and so on and so forth. And you have to consider all of the diagrams together in order to you know, get nice finite answers as we know from string theory. So that is not the case that was considered. So what are we considering? So in the type two theory, around the vacuum, there is no open string excited because there's no D brain. So what we can do is we can stick in a D brain by hand. So here is our diagram from yesterday. Here's the left and the right in this. Uh, here is the horizon. Here is one of the x's, x directions. Okay, and we will going to stick in a D brain like this. So, 
So now we are no longer in the vacuum. We are considering an excited state which contains a deep brain. So this computation of the cylinder diagram will be computing the extra contribution to the entanglement entropy from strings attached to this deep brain. So it's not the full entanglement entropy. It is just the contribution from the strings that are attached to this deep brain. Okay, so that's what we are going to compute. Okay, so let's just uh, make a table here that we will keep of the 10 coordinates. One, two, So there is going to be R and tau, right? These are the where we are orbifolding. The D brain will cover P minus one more directions. So these are P minus two here. So these are the D brain world volume directions. P plus one dimensional. Okay, all these eight directions were the horizon. Okay, that's this R8. But so what's left? There is these nine minus P directions left. P minus one, nine minus P is eight, plus two is ten. Okay. And of course, because of the different roles placed by these three sets of directions, they show up in different ways when you compute the one loop partition function. Yes, in the closed string, yeah, there are tachyons, yes. I'm going to, yeah, come to that. But first let us, yeah, so tachyons will come. But first let us think, what are we trying to compute? In the replica uh, case, we're trying to compute trace of rho to the n. Now rho is a density matrix with eigenvalues between zero and one. So if n is, little n is bigger than one, like in the covering spaces, if you raise a small number between zero and one to a big power, it gets shrunk, right? So this is well defined for like n bigger than or equal to one. But what we are trying to compute here is trace of rho to the one over n, right? With n being like two, three and stuff. So we are sort of amplifying the eigenvalues. Like if I raise a number which is between zero and one to a fraction of power, it gets amplified. And since rho is usually infinite dimensional, it is not clear that this object is actually well defined. So it's just infinite, right? So what's the way around? So this is basically v sub n. It turns out you write this as a moduli integral. So let me make another diagram. Let me make this here. So this is an open string of length pi and it is executing a loop in time circumference to pi t. Okay, so there's this modulus of the annulus. The annulus has one modulus, it's, it's t. And the partition, the cylinder partition function is written as an integral dt over t. This measure one over t is important. It basically comes because of this uh, translation invariance along this t direction. And here we compute a partition function with a fixed value of the modulus. Now we said this might can be divergent and indeed as um, Justin pointed out, the theory in the, has tachyons right on this covering space. So this object is has going to have usual divergences from the tachyon. And that is the source why this integral ends up being not uh, well defined for these values of the power of rho because of the tachyon in, in, the, in the closed string sector. Okay. So I don't understand, uh, what, what, what does this have to do with the tachyon? This is, let's say, set up uh, 
Well, what it has to do? Yeah, but that has to show up somehow in the string calculation, right? There is that is some argument from quantum mechanics that this object is not probably well defined, probably not well defined. But you have to see how it arises when you do the calculation in string theory. So when you go to the UV limit, that means capital T going to zero, you see that this integral has a is not converging near the boundary t equal to zero. But for any fixed n like n equal to two, presumably trace of square root rho there's no reason to expect it to be less well defined than no, there is because rho is defined as a positive definite density, positive definite yeah. matrix with trace one, right? Yeah. So it's like if you have infinite set of numbers. No, I know that there's <coughs> convergence, but you can imagine there would be situation. I mean, there would be rho some situations in which it can be true, right? Yeah, right. I, I can imagine for very large n that there would be everything all the uh, eigenvalues pile up to one, and so that would diverge, but. I think I mean, in a vacuum it won't converge at all because the, no. the, the convergence of rho is probably pretty really delicate. It's the fact that rho has a lot of very small <coughs> elements. <elements. coughs> Things are entangled with thermal heat. I mean, particles are left and right are entangled in some, in, some, in some thermal manner. And the fact that everything converges is pretty really delicate. So if you push up the eigenvalues, uh, it becomes like a square root. I would imagine yeah. that it would not converge. I think square root of yeah. the trace of square root of rho is very bad because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like you were. Uh, any IR issues and so on that I'm worried about, just because of the volume. That, that is always there, like whenever, because this D brain is infinite, right? So there's just that, that effect also. Sorry? So there's just that effect also, just the volume of that. Yeah, there's that effect, but that's, I mean, the point is when you expand this, this object is just proportional to the volume of these P minus one directions, times terms that are like um, E, to the plus one over t. And you want to be in the I mean, when you expand this in powers of e to the one over t, you get e to the plus one over t. So this is badly behaved near t equal to zero. So. so you're saying for a physical. Uh, so for some class of systems, for all quantum, uh, for, for finite dimensional, dimensional systems, it's fine. Finite dimensional, of course, everything is finite. Even but, quantum uh, theory, I think you could imagine states where, but I think those would not probably be finite energy states. If you have finite energy states, you have to have a lot of. I mean, that's where this Rich Dieter theorem and so on comes from. There's a lot of entanglement in the back. So if you take square roots and you, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not able to do it immediately, but I, I'm not, I would not be surprised if it did. Trace of rho is one. Yeah. So, uh, so trace of rho to the one minus epsilon, you would say, is divergent. Is divergent. Uh, it's, uh, uh. Yeah, I I want to agree with Subrat, but I don't have a concrete proof of that statement. So I don't know. But in this case, you can we can explicitly see that you it's know, not. Uh, it's, it, 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 um, uh, you have a partition function of an infinite number of degrees of freedom, infinite number of frequencies, and the occupancy is e to the minus beta omega. So now, um, right, and then uh, now if you make that e to the minus beta omega into e to the minus half beta omega, because you, you took a square root, yeah. so you, you, you pushed up everything you were summing over. That's like beta to beta by 2. It's beta to beta by two, but the, but the denominator is still one by zero beta because you know. So you're right, it's beta to beta by two, but uh, so that's why I'm worried that it, it would not. Uh, but uh, uh, no, you could uh, write it as divided by zero of beta by two times zero of beta by two divided by zero of beta. No, but I don't think the zero of beta is a you know because there's an infinite number of modes that you're summing over. So I'm not sure zero of beta is a is a finite quantity, but that's something. We, we can talk more. I mean, yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would not be, yeah. It's something we can work on. Yeah, but with the statue, I think it's worrying a little bit because it seems these are different, physically mm -hmm. different things. Why does the statue is really related to that? Diagram? No, it's. I mean, I'm just saying at a technical level, you look at this integral, right? You expand this in powers of one over t. What you're going to find is some e to the minus l zero over t, right? So if all the eigenvalues of l zero 
for positive, this is just has a nice convergent expansion and the integral is just well defined and fine. But it so happens that there is one value of L0 which is negative. So just this integral is not well defined. I'm just making that statement. I don't know if there's a deep relation between the existence of a tachyon instinct theory and this, this divergence of entanglement, maybe there is, but I don't know. This tachyon is there even in the superstring theories. Yes. Yeah, so this concretely we're doing this calculation in type 2. Type 2 theory. I'm confused. Why, 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 why didn't you project this out? Uh, I'm confused. Because by unitarity, just, I mean, the second is not there in the closed string sector, right? By unitarity. No, this theory is not, you're on an odd before. It's not unitary. So it's oh, the, the, I see. You, are, you have done this odd before, right? Oh. So there is a tachyon. But there's supposed to be a vacuum to which it flows to and all, but that's a different. Yeah, that's, we are just doing perturbation theory around the usual sort of three level solution. So yeah, so basically where these twisted sectors come in is because well, yeah, the tachyon comes in when you take this t goes to zero limit, right? And you, you do this usual open closed string duality where now this radius is 2 pi and uh, this you define to be 2 pi t twiddle with 2 pi t over pi being equal to 2 just the ratio has to still be the same. So t is 1 over 2 t delta, right? So when you look at the uv of this diagram, when this t is small, and you interpret it in the dual sort of frame as a closed string propagating over a long degree of freedom, that's where the tachyon comes in. So the tachyon is not really there in the open string spectrum, but since you're probing the closed string spectrum using the cylinder diagram, it comes in. So zn of t, can be written as d k n of t sum over k going from 0 to n minus 1 times 1 over n. So what this z k n is, is uh, instead of trace of e to the minus h t, there's an insertion of of the operator u to the k where u is the generator of 2 pi over n rotation, right? The thing that you are befolded. So this is all we have to do. We have to compute this. So now z has k, n, and t in it, okay? And what happens is that, you see, this u is going to twist stuff by e to the 2 pi i k over n. So this works out to be just a function of z and tau. Okay, where z, yeah, z is k over n and tau is like i t. This is the usual story. So we will get this function. I will just write in, in a minute, I'm going to write down an explicit form for this function, g of z comma tau. And here we are summing over z belonging to 1 over n, 2 over n, n minus 1 over n. OK. So of course, um, the trick is to convert this sum into a contour integral. Uh, and I'm just going to write a few equations and then explain. So this is equal to minus is equal to plus 1 over n sum over poles of k. Well, I will define k in a while, in a bit. k depends on z and n and j of z and tau is going to be minus 1 over n sum over poles of j, sorry, this should be residue, okay, k of 
z comma n times residue of j z comma tau. Okay. Where all these poles and residues are as functions of, of z. So what is k? k is just this trigonometric function. Okay. So what this has is because of this cotangent, it has poles at z equals 1 over n, 2 over n, n minus 1 over n. The pole at z equal to 0 is cancelled by this term. Okay. So this is k of z and n. And um, the z k n tau has the twisted sectors also. The, the twist, yeah, so in the open string, of course, there is no twisted sector, right? But so we're looking at the open string. Right? We are looking at the in the open string language, but we have to insert this u to the k because we have to project onto the zn invariant states. So this is what the summation is achieving, is achieving projection onto the zn invariant states. And the z k n is just one of the terms where we have inserted u to the k. And the full answer is, was this sum right, was a sum over k. The sum over k we converted into sum over poles of this function k, and which is then, because this function is, is well defined, this k times j defined at infinity is equal to minus the poles of, of j. Okay, so let me draw a diagram. I will write what j is in a bit, but let me draw a diagram. And for technical reasons, n will be taken to be odd. Um, so here is the z plane. Here is z equal to 0, z equal to 1, and here is z equal to a half. Okay. So k has poles here, right? 1 over n, n minus 1 over 2n, n plus 1 over 2n, n minus 1 over n. So these are the poles of k, right? The poles of J are a double pole at half, so there is a double pole here. The pole okay, and there is a okay, so this is the structure of the poles where the separation between the poles is set by this modular parameter t. Okay, so this sum is a sum over these red crosses, these points. Okay, and what is j? j is of course where all the fields and the eta functions and so on are hiding. So j of z comma tau equals some constant like pi and so on, v p minus 1. This is the volume of these p minus 1 directions, right? Because there are zero modes of the open string along these directions. Divided by t to the p minus 1 over 2. This comes from, again, momentum integrations along those same directions. There's an i over sine 2 sine 2 pi z. Doesn't matter. Sine 2 pi z, f to the fourth z comma tau divided by f of 2z comma tau eta to the sixth of tau. Okay, so this is coming from the fermions and these are coming from the bosons. So this z, remember, is the twist, is this z knows about the k. So and this eta 6 are the are 6 of these coordinates which don't know anything about the twisting in the boson. That's why there's an eta to the 6th. Okay, so this you can work out, but let's just take this as given. And what's f? f of z comma tau 
equals q to the one twelfth w So this W is really the twist plane, right? And it's it's related to Z in this way. Okay, so there's some completely explicit expression. F is written in terms of an infinite product, and we can read out the poles of J, right? This pole is where this F of two Z comma tau has zeros. And this is the Z. <clears throat> Okay, so the nice thing that has happened is remember we want to do analytic continuation in n. So j doesn't depend on n, like it depends on this z. But where the poles of j are that is completely independent of capital N. It's just in this z plane, right? So all the analytic continuation that needs to be done is in this k function. And k was just this, this guy. Right, so now we have to make up a suitable k that or some other expression equal to k which uh, is true and we can do this sort of individually for <coughs> so <coughs> so let me now say what the conditions of this Carlson's theorem are Sorry, uh, yes there's an independence in f also right and um, no. well let's just forget about this for example then it just depends on z right and we are so in this z there is a smooth band yeah, yeah z is you're saying there's a well, the analytic continuity. Yes, yes, yes. For uh, for the j part. Yes. So j of z comma tau is this completely analytic function in z. In z, fine. Uh, and um, so the statement is that k of z n is the one which is. The, uh, so where is the non electricity coming in uh, from the poles that are equal to 1, 2 over n? So here are the uh, things, right? So we are doing a contour integral of the function, let's say kj, right? There is one set of poles coming from the poles of k, which are precisely at these discrete values where we want to sum over. So the answer is a sum of the sum over the poles of k of this object, right? But because this function kj has nice properties at infinity, the sum over all the residues is zero. So that's equal to minus one over m times the poles of j. And the poles of j are, the positions of the poles of j are completely independent of n, once you fix. They only, they only depend on z. I mean, the, the poles are the ones where w is equal to yes. some e to the minus. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Those things vanish. Yes. And that's why, see, this q has this t in it, and that is what is setting the separation of the poles in, in z, this, this t. So, this is sort of the technical thing you have to do, and the trick is really with this k function. So, now, so what are the conditions of Carlson's theorem? So, let's just state it. Uh, without reference to any n or anything. So there is this kind of a thing is also needed, for example, if you're doing thermal Monte Carlo simulations where you only get data at discrete Matsubara frequencies, right? And you want to say, oh, there's an analytic function and this uniquely defined. So let's say we have some half play in some complex variable. Let's call it x. And let's say you know the value of the function at all the integers. So we know f of 0, f of 1, and so on. And we know that f of x, absolute value, is less than some e to the c times x in this half plane. What's the sign of C? Uh, it can be positive. 
Yeah, you only need it to be. Well, it depends on, I mean, you can have a function which is decaying, but it's enough. Even if C is positive, it's enough. There exists some C which is like this. Okay. So note that this rules out there cannot be any poles in this half plane because it has to be strictly less than some finite number. But f of i times alpha, where alpha is real, so that means on this axis, it has to be strictly less than, well, less than e to the pi alpha. So here the pi is, is pi, so it can't be fudged around. Because we know like there's a function sine of pi x which will vanish at all these points but it doesn't vanish everywhere. So this function towards these directions grows at, at this rate. So the, the statement is if you know f of these guys, you know this and you know this, then f of x is unique. Well, yeah. Okay, so you have to satisfy like these conditions. So let's see about this function k, right? There is this k. So we are trying to look at analyticity in n, right? So let's first focus on this set of poles, the poles that have are at real part of z equal to 0. So we will get from this first set of poles. We will get cotangent of pi times n times i times alpha, right? Where alpha is some, some number, some real number. Now, where are the poles? The poles are at pi n i alpha equals pi times integer, right? This cotangent has poles when the sign equals zero, that is when this happens. So n equals i integer over alpha, right? So there are no poles in this half plane of n for n bigger than zero, okay? So, and we can check that the rest of the conditions are satisfied. So at least for these set of poles, this k is already okay. We don't need to do anything, this is fine. We can continue as it is. Now the second set, um, set of x is, uh, happens when uh, poles, then, then we get cotangent of pi n times one half plus i alpha, right? Because all these are happening when real part of that is one half. So this hits a pole in n when pi n of one half plus i alpha equals pi times n integer. And this is bad because there is this real part here which will lead to poles in, in, in this half plane. So, so what you have to do is actually define a different k. You have to define a k2 which is pi n cotangent of pi n z minus half. Okay, you did z minus half basically to cancel this half. So again, you get some i alpha here. But now you have screwed up the function, right, by this pi n over 2. But you can fix it by adding a pi over 2 here. Okay, that's because n was odd. So in the end, you have only added pi over 2 times 1 minus n. And this is an integer times pi because n was assumed to be odd. So this is the same function. Minus pi cotangent of pi z. Okay, and this function, we will use when we sum over these crosses. So this is the subtlety in this in 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 this uh, calculation. We have to use a different k for these different sets of things. Okay, so now you have a completely explicit j. You can compute the residues. So in principle, you have your function. You can be happy, and that's that's basically it. 
but we want to get some sort of physical intuition <coughs> for what is really happening when you do these calculations. So let me erase this. So we will change at closed form answer not no and well closed form as in like it's this explicit answer and it's everything is completely explicit like the j is explicit the residues are explicit the analytic continuation we have made precise like k2 k2 and so on and yeah the limit but then going to one limit like for the entanglements of these excited strings yeah, yeah there is not a closed form answer but in principle you can take an n derivative right the n's are also completely explicit where the n's are so you can take an n derivative and get take the limit and go through so the physics Again, I, the interesting physics in the cylinder diagrams come from the UV limit of this t goes to zero uh, limit, which is the t twiddle goes to infinity limit. Okay, so that's what we want to look at. And we will focus on a specific contribution that comes from this set of poles. I mean, there are lots of different contributions, but I want to focus on this contribution that comes from this second set of poles. Is uh, zero to infinity d t tilde over t tilde to the nine minus p over two. I mean, there's a standard bag of tricks that goes with this set of calculation. One is like you have to use the modular transform property of the eta function, and a Poisson resummation is helpful. So we do all that, and we end up with. This expression is a bit lengthy, but we will get some interesting physics from this. Okay, this is the expression. So, what is this? This integral is just the integral dt that was there. There is a sum over, well, there was a sum over poles, but the Poisson resummation co converts it into the sum over this variable m and then a Fourier transform, right? Okay, so <coughs> we want to do this x integral. Now, the idea is as t goes to zero, right, in this limit, these poles are becoming very close to each other. So we should be able to replace this sum by an integral. So the leading contributions here come when 2m plus 1 is either like 1 or minus 1. Okay, because t tilde is getting large, so um, yeah, you want this least value of m. So let's list the poles of this function, this this guy here, right? So <coughs> poles in x. So the cinch pi of x has poles at zero plus minus i plus minus two i plus minus three i and so on, right? Right. The cinch has zeros there. That means this integrand has poles there. Tang of pi x over 2 has poles at plus minus i plus minus 3i plus minus 5i and so on, right? So you might think that plus minus i you are getting a double pole from a product of this term and this term. Okay, and the zero is not really problematic because the numerator has a zero there. So let's look at tanch of pi n x over 2. This guy has poles at plus minus i over n, plus minus 3i over m, plus minus 5i over n, and so on. Okay, so first thing to notice is there are not really any double poles. When Let's first do the case when n is an, an odd integer, because the plus minus i also appears in this list, right? It will appear when this numerator is equal to n. So this guy is not really a pole. So we don't really get any double poles. We get, all get single poles, right? So the single poles, yeah, so for example, so this one is the closest to the real x-axis. So what is the contribution of, of this guy? So we just put it in and we see this exponential of 
2 i pi i over n times t tilde. Okay. Um, well, there was this e to the 2 pi t tilde here sitting outside. So this is really a tachyon. Like this is like a e to the plus t tilde term, right? Because this this coefficient is greater than this coefficient. So these are all the both. These are all the tachyon sort of contributions from i over n to sort of the last one before plus minus i, and those are sort of the one tachyon in each k sector. Okay, so it's those are the tachyons and so on, but. Let's now try to go to this covering space, right? This we said that trace of rho to the little n is well defined when little n is bigger than one. So, so you see when n is let's say one third or one half, this is like three i. So it is not the first pole. The first pole is now this plus minus i, and it's a double pole. So there is no tachyon, but you have a double pole. This is now like the analytic continuation, etc. No tachyon. Okay, but plus minus i becomes a double pole. And again, this is good because we know that when n is one half, we are really computing trace of rho squared. So it is sort of gels back with the fact that trace of rho squared is well defined and the tachyon is gone, right? Trace of rho cube is well defined and there is no tachyon. Some technical relation between these two things. Okay, so now I'm going to draw, uh, okay, anyway, but now when you compute in dynamic entropy, right, you actually get a triple pole because the, the, the main source of the problem is there's a one over, uh, well, there's an n here and there's some n. So when you take an n derivative, you get a triple pole at the same location. So, I mean, what does all this mean? Okay, there's a double pole, there's a triple pole, like. Here's the idea. So when you have a double pole in this integrand, the residue will be a derivative of this, right? You're supposed to take a derivative, an x derivative. <coughs> an x derivative will bring down a t tilde. Right? So there's an extra power of t tilde when you take an x derivative of this factor. So usually in like ma exchange of massless states, we are supposed to get d t tilde 0 to infinity over t tilde to the 9 minus p over 2 times like so usually like you know we have e to the minus l0 t tilde right and if l0 is 0 this is just some and I mean this power is not random this has like physics in it it's saying that p equals 7 grain or 8 or 9 grains uh, have issues Okay, p equals 7, you can see because it's dt tilde over t tilde and we are focusing on the large t tilde region, there's a divergence. And this has to do with the fact that, just the fact that in, even in electrodynamics, if you have a line charge, right, if you have a line of charge in 3D, its potential goes as log r. It's, it's big. And similarly, if you have a sheet of charge, its potential goes like r. So the higher the dimensionality of the object, the stronger the potential that it creates. So this is sort of the physics that a very, a, a brain that is more than co-dimension three has IR issues. And this is reflected in the fact that only up to D6 brains are okay. But once you get this double pole, see the business is like, now you don't get just some eigenvalue times T tilde you get an extra power of t tilde here <coughs> because of this derivative that we have today. So you end up getting dt tilde over 7 minus p over 2. 
so this makes the d5 and d6 also uh, sort of have these infrared issues okay so it's this kind of there is no physical interpretation for this like this analytic continuation seems to give you this answer and now to compute the entanglement entropy you will even have a further because you have a triple pole so you have to take a second derivative that pulls down two powers of t tilde square so you have something like so this is just for computing z of n when n is not an integer compute the EE, you really need P uh, less than or equal to So yeah, in this in his paper, in Witten's paper, it said it's not really clear what this means. Okay, yeah, I mean, you don't need, you, yeah, yeah. Others, there's no well defined answer because divergence from. Yeah, just the fact that we have this infrared divergence. And yeah, so there's no way to yeah, isolate it or understand what it means. Uh, and, and so he, he doesn't have any no. proposal. No. But surely for people of three or something, it should make sense. Yeah, that was one would have hoped. But this analytic continuation seems to give IR problems even when p equals 3. I are in, in this t tilde variable. So in, in the open string, it is really a UV problem, right? And string theory is supposed to cure the UV, UV problems, for at least for up to p equal to 6. I don't know if theories of d7 brains or d8 brains. I don't know. Yeah, because you can't neglect back reactions. Yeah, yeah, so it's a similar. So what you're saying here is that to compute the entanglement entropy, the back reaction of even a D3 brain is important. That's, yeah. <clears throat> okay, let me say if I had some other comment to make. Yeah, but uh, just one comment. I understand that Atish and Witten are working on the type 1 version of this problem with the D9 brain in the vacuum and there are some well the conclusion is we computed this cylinder diagram in these covering in these order folds and therefore we computed the we computed this as an analytic function in n for p less than or equal to 2 and therefore we computed the entanglement entropy due to open strings that are attached to such a deep brain. yeah for p less than or equal to 2 can one compare uh, at least for p less than equal to 2 with because in the end these would be just young uh, uh, so can, can one compare uh, with some you're looking oh, essentially at the entanglement entropy I mean in a p theory limit you would have looked yes. at the entanglement entropy of some young yeah. theory uh, yeah. with matter yeah yeah uh, that limit should be contained in this thing Yes, at, that. Uh, at week, yeah, yes. Coupling, yeah, so. yeah, you can. So, for example, from the t goes to infinity limit, we focused on the t goes to zero limit. The field theory limit is the t goes to infinity limit, and yeah, perhaps you can read off some some answers for Yang Mills but contributions. Some, to uh, there's no meaningful comparison that people have. I, uh, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Yeah, this is an obvious I, I agree. It's a good one, yeah. So you would see the angles answer and then other the corrections to that answer, presumably, uh, coming from. Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the alpha prime correction, correction would be this sort of this t integral, right? This. The no, I, I thought in your first uh, lecture you had the motivation that you had, you know, this thing which was extensive divided by some cutoff epsilon. Now yes. your whole motivation was that maybe you you would cure some of that. Uh, um, uh, so do you see some what replaces that in this case that would 
Yeah, yeah, because see the UV divergence is coming from the t goes to zero limit, right? And we saw that at least for p less than or equal to two, the UV in string theory is the usual story that it becomes this IR. No, no, I understand why it is finite, but what I'm saying is that uh, uh, oh, you wanted to see, no, how what replaces. You're saying uh, what the epsilon is in the end, yeah, like something what like is that. The, uh, yeah, what is the what is the cutoff? I mean, I thought that was one of the motivating things. Too. Yeah. Comparison to yeah, you need that. Two plus one yeah, that's, uh, two plus yeah, because p equals two. Let's say we forget about all right, uh, uh, the p yeah. So, the, uh, so there, so or one well, plus one uh, something. Uh, sort of the first thing that comes to mind is again like all these z's right were proportional to this v p minus one. So the entanglement entropy is again proportional to this v p minus one, right. but. The thing that makes up the dimension <coughs> here is alpha prime. So the epsilon got replaced by some power of alpha prime. But can you read up the, there should be a part which is corresponds to the angles part, which you yeah. don't have any alpha prime. This is some other divergent part, which this is what epsilon is. And if there should be, presumably there should be a way of also reading of the decay. <coughs> So, but this this is what I mean. What, the question: What is the question here? So we know that the Yang Mills from a field theory point of view is supposed to have a contribution that is proportional to some volume divided by some UV cutoff. And then there are other terms. And then there are other terms. And then there are other terms, right? Yeah. So those other terms will depend on the fact that it's Yang Mills. So the other terms are actually in the sense that things we really measure. For example, if you yeah. look at the relative entropy or the difference of one element entropy. So no, no, sorry. I'm even thinking that the one loop contribution of the Yang Mills fields themselves is UV divergent, right? Let's forget about the leading area divergence. Let's think about computing just loops of Yang Mills fields. Even those are UV divergent, right? I suppose here you only compute yeah. the one loop correction. Yeah, yeah this is a one loop correction. Yeah. This is not the tree level, right? He doesn't so, have the tree level answer. He doesn't yeah, have the that, That's what is in the So now the one here is universal finite. So the one loop correction, I don't know. I mean, now for, the, for what? So there's for some the term we expect which comes from the spectrum, and now there's some one loop correction to that term. That it's yeah. really no one has considered. I mean, it's a one loop correction to the but entire one. Really it's just a free theory still, right? It's one loop. I mean, when people talk of the. No, it's not a free angle. This is the one loop correction in. in uh, so there's a T angle. So no, but it's a loop, it's a vacuum diagram. Yeah, but the vacuum diagram in field theory has UV divergences, right? No, no, that, that's fine. But the question was whether the, uh, people would have computed probably the finite part of this in the. Suppose I, I just got a field theorist, I mean, and I wanted to compute the entanglement entropy. I just need to compute the vacuum diagram, isolate the, the, the UV divergent piece, and then there'll be some finite pieces. No, I think. Uh, I'm not Oh, you're asking about if there is a finite piece contribution that can be compared. That should be, and it's a free Young Mills calculation. Well, it's a vacuum diagram. Uh, 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 three dimensions there are finite pieces. In three dimensions. Yeah. So that uh, this is three dimensions. Two plus one. Two plus one. That is, uh, we can. And that's well, known. That's why I'm just really confused about something. There's a leading contribution which comes from the free part. And that, that would have corresponded to me. Uh, in this case, the disk diagram, I would have thought. No, these one loop is like the field theory is still free, right? It's not yeah, it's like the one loop diagram, diagram is still a free exactly. diagram. It's just a. It's a free uh, diagram, a, so I, I agree. And then, so, so you're asking. Be, uh, you isolate the UV divergent piece, there should be some finite piece. Some finite piece, piece or some coefficient of some log that is that yeah. is perfectly well defined. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, in this 3 plus 1, there's a finite log. log. Yeah, yeah, but but one plus one. Over but here the Yangles field is at least to study one plus one and two plus one. Yeah, but the Yangles field here is propagating in the p plus one dimensions, right? So for p equals two, for example, two plus one. Yeah, yeah so two plus, plus one. That should be able to be right. compared to one, a, one plus one Yangles. Uh, yeah. But there are then some scalar fields of the whole supersymmetry. Yeah. Thing. Okay, yeah, that's a good good question. And then of course all these uh, such things. This is actually a broader question. I have. There are these subtleties in defining the entanglement of the angles uh, field itself. You know, it's just even another study. Yes, yes. So, uh, oh, you know, it's it's not clear where those subtleties were addressed here. Now that the entanglement entropy of the angle theory is not a well-defined object. It's ambiguous up to a choice of center. 
Well, we had only one D brain. We stuck in only one D brain. So the theory on that is whatever you get from the one. Yes, but it's not very effective because the inverse phase really doesn't factor across the line. So there is really an inherent ambiguity in defining the entanglement entropy, which corresponds to his choice of center. So you can make this electric center choice or various other choices of center. Well, let's say you take this so you want to So you want to You want to hear what it is? That much of ambiguity, I am sure that will be. But there is an ambiguity. I mean, it's, it's not. It's I, an no, I, I know, uh, but uh, you, you, you want, I would think, for the free theory, it's not it is. Why is it ambiguous? Does he actually give up? Yeah, we are not. So, with I mean, the certain choices, with yeah, the choices, so. Yeah. With no, the no, Maxwell theory. With Maxwell. With the electric, I think some electric centers. There's no center, and you want that to be. Uh, but you still have virtual lines which can run. Uh, this way or the, I mean, this, the center is just because uh, there, there are there's a Gauss stop in between. Yeah. So, so, so now, so there are some some operators that belong to both you know, sure. left algebra yeah. and right algebra. Uh, so you have to decide uh, which sub algebra you're looking for. So can I ask, I don't know that literature very well, but is the ambiguity showing up in the leading entanglement entropy or in the one loop? I think it should show up in, uh, uh, I, I would imagine it should show up in the leading entanglement entropy. But so that we are not computing here. But it should also show up in one loop. I mean, oh, that's what I'm asking. So does it is it there in one loop also? Um, yeah. Well, I, have, I, I mean, uh, we yeah, just so play Maxwell theory. I thought uh, in two plus one, first we free Maxwell theory. You can even dualize it or something uh, and uh, write it in terms of scalar yeah, theory. Uh, I think Suprat is like if you imagine sort of putting the U1 gauge theory on the lattice. Then no, the I, I, I'm, I'm aware of uh, all the various issues that people have talked about, but what I'm saying is in the 2 plus 1 Yangner's theory case, where it's just free Maxwell equation U1, 2 plus 1 Maxwell equation in free theory, okay. ideally at least you can, uh, and I thought Cassini and others yeah, uh, studied the entanglement entropy for no, that. You study uh, meaning uh, even in the choice of center, you can study. No, for free, I think for I free, think in 2 mean? plus 1, I don't think there should be even much of this because then you can dualize it to phi and then if you don't have monopoles or something like that, you probably will not be encountering any topological obstacle either. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there is a, I don't know, if you do that, just find my first point. I think the replica trick corresponds to some choice of electric center. Yeah. So it's a certain, you know, there's uh, a certain... Uh, one way to say it is there's a choice because in this replica spaces, there is a, this conical singularity. So there are choices of couplings that you can put to the curvature at the singularity. So the, the flat space Lagrangian doesn't completely define what kind of counter terms you can have along this singular surface. So those are part of the ambiguity in, in all this sort of... So I, I know like last time I heard a talk about this that this entanglement of Maxwell fields, there's still like two groups that are sort of contesting what's the correct answer. So it's I agree with Rajesh that there should be a clean answer, but I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's not being... So what's wrong with the fact that this, you need to define which sub algebra you're talking about? It's not no, a, but in the continuum not... right now, you're, on the lattice you can define some algebra and take some limit. But the point is, as you take the continuum limit, if there is a finite, let's say you pick some center end, right? I think even you pick one. Some center, I think you get an answer. Get an answer on the lattice. And yes, and I agree that we can continue limit to that answer. I'm not, I mean, and the so continuum limit, I, what I'm saying is there's a subtlety in going to the continuum limit. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. But all I'm saying is, I don't see how one will get it. I still haven't understood. No, I think for two plus one dimensional angles, it might be very naive, but there is a, a at least in that case, there's a very naive this thing where you just dualize to a scalar and it will be probably ma matched. Maybe there is an implicit choice no, of some implicit choice, choice, but whatever. But let's no, say that we stick to that case. One comment is that these duality maps are sort of non local in field space. Sure. So it's not clear for how local entanglement behaves under such changes of variables in the path effect. It's not uh, clear yeah, that you can just say you realize it. Actually, the reason I'm, the reason I'm asking this is because I think there are some conceptual issues involved with defining entanglement, especially in theory of that when you go to the close field piece. And this choice of center is the simplest conceptual issue. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that one does a calculation and gets some answer is, you know, I, one, I feel that the conceptual issue. Yeah, at least, but and the gravity subtlety is not there because. We are doing a 1 over g string uh, contribution on top of 1 over g string square contribution. And we are only doing it for double degree. So, so you would like to do the sphere diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there you would encounter those subtleties. But at least for this disk and cylinder diagrams, 
or the torus, for example, that's that's the beauty of it being a gravitational theory is not there. It's so okay. like this boundary is still going to fluctuate a little bit. Yeah, but we do that in ADS-CFT, right? We we pick some uh, surface, there's an RT surface, and there's a one loop term, and so on. And there's a way to make it. There's a way to define it in perturbation in, in loops. Right? Actually, uh, no, there is a subtle key there, right? Because this this whole you know there's this entanglement wedge conjecture. I don't think one really understands how that works at subleading order and one over n. But it's true, there's a leading part you calculate from the boundary that is area to be that kind of surface. Now, and then there may be a free part also you can calculate, which corresponds to free gravity. But so the moment you start considering the fact that the Yutakinagi surface itself fluctuates due to gravity, but that, that comes in at two loops? Yeah, it will come in when one uh, takes interacting gravity into account. Uh, so it may even be three levels in the part. But I thought the one loop contribution to the RT formula is perfectly right. Yeah, this one loop is probably the free gravity contribution. I mean, there's a. Uh, the way but the loop. interactions come with powers of G and H bar x, but That's probably it. sort of for higher. There's, there's one, one additional term, but one considers yeah. interactions in the bulk. And then there's really a conceptual question there, which I think is important. In, in, uh, in some cases, it may totally change the answer. You know, uh, okay. I. I, yeah, you know, one case in which it totally changes the answer, for example, is if you look at regions which, which can be surrounded by, you know, this, this Rindler wedge, you can feel theory often do a conformal map, so you can turn it into a diamond. Yes. So there's a relation for the half line and half plane, and yes. that's also the, yes. in gravity, that's almost certainly wrong, because for the diamond, you know, the, the region outside <coughs> has all information about what's happening inside the diamond. So the theory of gravity, do you see what I'm saying? No. So you, let's say you thought of a segment. <coughs> the theory of gravity. Yeah. You ask what is the entanglement of the segment with the rest? Yeah. Uh, the answer is that, that the rest of the theory, which is just outside the segment, already has all the information about what's happening inside the segment just because of holography. Yeah, but that sort of non perturbative statement. No, no, but it's, right? no, it's, no, it's a field theory. Well, it's a, uh, it's a non perturbative statement, but the thing is that eventually you, you know, the region outside knows that the Whole state is pure without making direct reference to the, the segment. So the entanglement of the answer is zero when you turn on gravity. But the answer is not a finite number for us. If you try to compute the entanglement of this, region, I would just say if, if you have like fully fluctuating theory of gravity, like an interval doesn't even make sense. Like what what is an interval, right? That is the question that you're indirectly asking. Yeah, but I think what you could define maybe in some in perturbation theory, like you can define it, right? That's right. So, so I think in perturbation theory, it should one should be able to sort of track what this interval is doing as you keep more. I don't know. That's my at least my intuition. Of course, in the fully like you're summing over completely crazy samples, the notion of an interval itself is gone, right? In the of gravity. Okay. Perturbatively, I think at least one loop I thought this Faulkner loop which Marlon say now completely. They don't take into account the interactions at all. This is just taking three variables. And the interactions are one over n, right? So okay. if one loop means a one over n direction, that, that's the complete contribution at order n to the zero. I agree, but this is the there is no gravity part. This could have been a scalar, you know, the fact that it's gravity, the interesting aspects of gravity yeah. are absent in the fault value. Yeah, so maybe that is what you're saying is so in the RT formula, like there is this contribution as opposed to square right. squared. That's right. Then there's a contribution that's n to the zero. That's right. And maybe the subtleties start showing up at subleading orders in one over there. Correct. So these, yeah, yeah okay. okay. But it might even be when you include all orders, the answer you thought was finite actually becomes zero. So, you know, it, it may, you, the corrections yeah. may. All be, orders plus the non perturbative Yes, and actually the full answer may be zero in some cases, yeah. whereas you thought it was n squared. Yeah, that's fine. Actually, the answer is zero. Yeah. I, so, I agree. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So I agree with that statement, but that's a very non perturbative gravity state. I don't think this one loop term can capture it. Mm -hmm. So in this Britain's paper, uh, he takes this uh, t delta e power minus n t delta yes. and the sign that there is a log uh, logarithmic operator. Uh, yeah, I didn't want I didn't mention it, but the what log this means is if you put this t delta in the exponent, you have a log t delta. That is the origin of the word logarithmic scale. I don't know anything about it, so I didn't want to mention it. But what I can mention is what he so explains. This, so this entanglement entropy computation is in a log scheme. The idea is if you were to directly define what the world field sigma model is for these fractional values of n, it would be a logarithmic series. So in the Alpha-Ford case, it's a perfectly normal CFD, but and we have defined it from Alpha-Ford. But if you were to directly say 
what uh, CFT is <coughs> for the public space, it would be this logarithmic scale. Yeah, let me just say this one thing. So you can get this type of things if you have if your L0 in some two-dimensional subspace looks like this operator. So this is not diagonalizable. This so this L0 squared is just zero. So into the L0 is like L0 alpha is just one plus alpha L. So it is one one alpha zero. Right. And now when you start taking the trace. Uh, you take the trace and the state over which you're taking the trace involves some of that in combination. Like you will start getting these alphas in, in the traces. That's the common that But yeah, so it has to do with uh, it, this kind of behavior can be reproduced by taking L0 to be funny matrices of this sort, which are square to zero and so on. 